Thank you very much. Um, welcome to my presentation on how we can spot future retro classics. As you can see, I'll try to hold this um, talk in English, just for the sake of the possibly uh, wider um, um, audience. So, what is this um, talk all about? Um, as you probably have noticed, if you want to buy a retro computer nowadays, you often pay uh, substantial prices that are partially even prohibitive. There are, of course, strategies to mitigate this, but they are quite labor-intensive, like opening a museum or op opening um, a popular web blog where people then tend to give you computers. On the other hand, um, with some computers having substantial value from these increased prices, it seems like an opportunity to maybe make a business out of this opportunity or uh, use this opportunity as an investment. And the question that I am asking myself is, are these good opportunities and which criteria would I have to follow uh, model-wise in order to use these opportunities. And to answer these questions, uh, we first start by uh, looking at how computer prices evolve over time or what my theory of how computer prices evolving over time is. So this is my principal um, computer graph. We will go over the different phases uh, in detail um, in a minute, but uh, we can see uh, it starts at an initial price when the product is first launched, set by the manufacturer. It then uh, relatively sharply um, declines with the slope of uh, electronic devices. It then lingers at some minimal point and then maybe goes up again in one of um, different slopes um, upwards. Let's look at this first phase. Um, the first phase of the phase of usefulness, which I call it um, in this initial period, the price of the model is mainly determined by the manufacturer. This is the, the phase where the manufacturer sells the model. Um, typically for electronic devices, we have a decline, whether it's that sharp or not, is maybe not really um, of consequence. And then in the next part of this phase of usefulness. Um, the product is not sold by the manufacturer anymore, but there might be third parties that sell um, rest quantities of the product, and the price is still determined by its remaining usefulness. So maybe it's not fresh at the market anymore, but it's still somewhat useful, and depending on the usefulness, um, the price is also um, determined. Um, at the end of this useful period, um, we tend to get rid of these devices because they are of no use for us anymore. They are just uh, trash and uh, we uh, maybe sell it or give it away. The next phase is what I would call the garbage phase. In this uh, phase, um, the um, device basically lost all its usefulness. Basically, no one wants to buy it. And as the supply outweighs the demand, no one feels the urge to buy because there are so many on the market. Um, and the prices are close to a minimum. And this minimum is determined by the amount of money for the seller that outweighs the effort to sell it. So it's quite low. But if it's too low, there is no real point for the seller to sell it. So it's at a, a certain uh, minimum point. And then um, something is starting, which I will call the sentimental phase. And the sentimental phase um, is basically triggered by midlife crisis, which typically also um, is connected to an orientation towards one's past. And also, it's typically a phase where the net income is quite high. Now, this orientation towards uh, one's past then leads one to think about, uh, with nostalgia, with, um, about the things that one had in his uh, youth, which um, one possessed or which were maybe attractive. 
and this is um, the imprinting period um, of our person. Um, the person in this phase has some sense of attractivity. It feels some things uh, it should have or it could have, but maybe um, it's um, it has some of the models, um, but it's maybe too poor to uh, afford others. So maybe it has uh, C64 in this phase, but this pesky Amiga was always too expensive for him. And um, this is then um, the um, period where the models are first bought by this person in question with the midlife crisis. It tends to um, buy um, things that he or she once had or that he or she once wanted but couldn't afford. So in this red phase, this means for us, and this is um, all the same age group, and therefore we have also an age of a user axis um, through this graph, we see that an increasing number of new buyers appear, and because they uh, buy again these prices, uh, these this devices, the prices increase. This again leads to more people selling it because now it's more, um, it gives you more money to sell it. And uh, maybe at some point the demand then outweighs the, outweighs the supply, which in again leads to prices uh, increases again. Um, and um, what's also too very typical is that these prices do not necessarily depend on the initial price by the manufacturer, but they depend more on an individual budget, on some notion of attractivity at this point, on the demand and supply, of course, and on the social value. The, the value that a device has, if I can show it to my friends, and if they say, oh, that's great, um, that's the social value of the device. Now, um, I have different curves here um, for different uh, devices, so I'm not saying every device um, increases um, the same, with the same slope. And um, I think these uh, models uh, are different, demanding on the attractivity, but also on the demand supply ratio. And if we look at um, the models, especially in comparison to the initial price, we see that the majority of the, of the models and these percentages are just what I feel. I don't have data to support this. That most of these models are never sold for the same price as initially. Uh, but we also see a small amount of models will even um, go higher than initial price or be much higher than the initial price. Um, and now if we look further on at the age of our, um, of our collecting user, we see um, that maybe um, it will, he, will, he or she will stop collecting, maybe because it doesn't find uh, the, 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 the hobby is not interesting anymore, other things are more interesting. Maybe there's a need of money. There's a need of space. Um, people are getting too old, and then their stuff gets sold or thrown away, and uh, the market is happy about uh, a bunch of these um, devices. Um, now the question, of course, is what happens to the prices once a generation quits collecting either because they die or because they uh, leave the field. And this question or the answer to this question depends to whether the corresponding field is maybe something like art, where the value is mainly uh, kept over time, maybe increases, sometimes also decreases, sometimes of, of art are not always increasing, but go out of fashion and are valued uh, uh, negatively, or whether they are, for example, like telephone cards. If you remember these, there were, was a time that these were feverishly 
collected when telephone cards were in use and there were rare ones and they had high prices. But as soon as telephone cards were not used anymore, also the market broke down for these things. Now, if one wonders how our retro uh, computer market, uh, market uh, which of these models it will follow, I think it will be more like um, telephone cards. Um, and this is because um, our generation found home computers, for example, very exciting, interesting, and we had a high sentimental value to them. But uh, next generations didn't have this excitement of computers in their youth. They had PCs and they were workhorses, they were tools uh, like uh, any other tools. So um, they don't feel the excitement of home computers anymore. And therefore, I'm thinking um, that uh, this market um, will um, shrink in, times, uh, in number of persons and therefore also um, prices will shrink. It will not mean that there won't be any collectors. There are always collectors that, that collect everything. Um, and, but the, the number of collectors that uh, collect stuff uh, will be small. There are always people who um, collect beer mugs, um, but um, maybe not so many. There will be always people who collect old computers, but maybe not, not so many. Um, so before I continue, um, before you ask, does this model explain everything price-wise? Of course not. And there are more reasons to collect computers than a midlife crisis. Also, often it's maybe a starting point. But uh, I, uh, and there are of course different life courses than the one uh, that I sketched here. But I think it's a very typical. Uh, life for the bulk of computers buying computers today. And the bulk of people are not necessarily collectors like we are. There are maybe people who have one or two computers um, which they bought recently and they have on their coffee table uh, and not more, but there are many of these. It's not applicable to other products and this model is a theory and not backed up by data but at least as every theory, it aims to explaining some effects. Now I said, we will all die and the retro computer market will collapse. So, uh, okay, so why do you look for future retro classics? So maybe it's not retro computers. Maybe um, there are other devices uh, um, which are interesting, um, which you could, could buy today and be happy about having in the future. Um, and my first criteria for devices that might become classics is, as I said before, it's something that young people uh, were getting excite excited about. Um, we have seen, we expressed the mechanism of price in a sentimental phase only by the sentimental value of a device, because as I said, I think that's the driver that uh, alleviates the collection era, area from just being a thing for a few nerds to a somewhat mass phenomenon, having also mass phenomenon prices. Um, and in order for this mechanism to work properly, it needs to be of a very high positive sentiment at that time which means it needs to be something which was considered to be cool at that time. For example, cars in the 70s and 80s and 90s and subsequent eras, home computers in the, in the 80s and maybe smartphones in the 2010s. But of course, this is not the only criteria. It also needs to be somehow attractive. Also, this and the next criteria are not telling you what will be a classic, but maybe what will be a more expensive, more desirable classic. So um, if a device is something people are excited about, of course, it's automatically attractive to, some, to these people. However, some devices can be attractive even when there are people not necessarily excited about this. And this could be an uh, example for this could be a high technological, technological or historical significance of a device. And um, 
this is something which is not ne necessarily clear at the beginning, but um, the uh, historic significance, for example, crystallizes out only after the time that device was on the market. Let's look at one example, the HTC Dream that I have also at the exhi exhibition booth. Um, HTC Dream, also known as the T-Mobile G1, uh, is a smartphone developed by HTC and it was first released in September 2008 and therefore it was the first commercially released device to use the Linux-based Android operating system. Also, it was a commercial success. So um, T-Mobile alone sold over a million G1s in the US um, which accounted at that time of, uh, for two-thirds of the devices on its 3G network. There was no guarantee that Android would have the importance that it has um, today or that Google wouldn't kill Android after that model. But as it stands nowadays, um, the HTC Dream has this sign historical significance being the first Android phone because Android carried over and has uh, so many models nowadays existing on the market. Also, the technological significance of the HTC Dream, let's say, compared to an Apple iPhone or the first Apple iPhone is somewhat um, debatable. The next, uh, no, continuing on this, it's somewhat uh, attractive uh, motive. Another aspect of attractiveness, of course, is the brand of a device. Um, as uh, collectors um, sometimes often collect the devices of a brand and ideally all devices of the brand, this of course also influences the price. Um, one example here is um, for example PCs and we look just at the uh, IBM models, the early IBM models versus the rest. And then we see that um, the early IBM PCs, XTs, ATs um, are historically significant models. Technologically, they are not really great. But if we look, for example, at a PC Junior, it's already interesting only from an IBM point of view because historically it was not really significant. But if you collect early IBM computers, PCs, then you won't also collect a an, an, an PC junior. Also, as we know, this is obviously more true. Uh, the more true, the more fanatic uh, the loyal fans of a brand are. <coughs> The next criteria, of course, is it's something rare and um, you all know this uh, acknowledged, uh, universally acknowledged aspect of collectible goods. Um, rarity, also it sounds like an objective value, is often not easy to establish for electronic devices because most of the times we don't really have access to production numbers. They are sometimes communicated, but only basically retroactively. Uh, and um, for most models, I'd say it's more hearsay than uh, actually fact. And the number of surviving devices in the market today are even harder to um, establish. There is something which you all have that is felt rarity. Every collector has an impression of the rarity of a device, but this is typically um, determined uh, more by the market availability currently. It doesn't mean that there are not many collectors which have already such a device, but don't offer it on the market. But if you don't see it on the market appearing on, for example, eBay, you have the impression it's, it's rare. This felt rarity, of course, is also determined by market, by location. So in Germany, for example, a uh, Commodore uh, 116 um, is rare, but it's not so rare than it is on the US market where it was never released. Um, so it changes also over markets. Uh, and of course, also um, the currently achievable price determines the felt rarity, because when the price is low, people are uh, uh, 
less people are willing to sell and um, you feel it's maybe not so uh, um, available and when prices increase suddenly there is uh, more offers on the markets because for this price also collectors are maybe uh, willing to sell this device. And there are, of course, always reasons why devices uh, are rare. Either it was expensive, at least um, for the masses. So, um, for example, um, this device, you probably cannot read it. It's a Fujitsu FM8. It was the basically the first home computer by Fujitsu. It was a quite um, expensive um, offering about 218 kilo yen. So the market say, uh, this was it's too expensive for me. So they do what uh, companies often do. They split the model in an up market and in a down market value. So the Fujitsu FM8 was a big hit in Japan with a price of only 126 k yen, whereas the up market version of this model, the Fujitsu FM11, was uh, about 300 something K um, yen because the price point was not the right price point for the mass market. Of course, a major reason for being rare is that the device was unsuccessful because it was too late, too faulty, did not offer any distinctive values, did not hit the competitive price point, or didn't have a viable audience. Uh, another reason was that it might be uh, that it was superseded maybe by not a model uh, relatively um, fastly, usually because it wasn't successful. So many of you know that the predecessor of the TE994A was the TE99-4, not without the A. Um, and they simply improved it, for example, keyboard-wise, relatively fastly and uh, then had a, had a better uh, model uh, with this one. So, which means that the T99.4 is a relatively rare model. Um, and of course, manufacturers went out of business or dropped the product line, either because it wasn't successful or because there were reasons outside the product. Maybe the company was bought by another company and they dropped the line. Maybe Steve Jobs came back and um, closed some projects. Um, or it was limited, also this happens very rarely, and I can only think of the 20th anniversary Mac, which was an explicitly limited computer, a little bit meant for collecting one-headed impression. Um, now, the interesting thing about rarity is on its own, it does not constitute a high retro price, just because something is rare, doesn't mean it's expensive necessarily. Um, there need to be another factor that leads to an attractivity of this device. And I have here three examples of my collection you probably never have even heard of, which are super rare, but no one cares. So the first one is a super rare export version of your Soviet era uh, Spectrum clone, the PIC Master. And the reason why, because no one cares, is there were many Soviet Spectrum clones. Um, they appeal only to a small portion of collectors, and these models often have no historical or technological uh, appeal. Uh, yeah. Or the NCR Safari um, 3115, uh, extremely rare uh, Windows 3.1 pen tablet from 93. Mobile computers are not appealing to many people, and this one is neither particularly early or technologically advanced. Also, it's ugly, doesn't help the model. Or an Epson EHT10, which is an, I'd say, extremely rare handheld terminal version of the PX4. It's a um, POS terminal, a mobile computer meant for industrial use. And that's uh, basically, in my opinion, the, the death warrant for many uh, uh, rare computers because no one is really interested often in industrial um, computers. Maybe we are, but not the masses. Um, they're not loved, so they have no sentimental value or known. 
and they are also uh, quite easily disposed of in industry when they're not useful anymore. So these are the criteria that I have. Is there now um, a recipe, a way to identify candidates of these future retro classics? And this is my current recipe. As I said, it all depends on the age. So first you have to determine the age group that you want to target. Um, and uh, because we want to hit this um, trash um, valley of prices, we select an age group which is not older than 25 years. And then we have to um, do our research and look at what was all the rage when this generation was young category-wise. We read articles, we watch maybe videos, we look at lists of failed technology from this time period. Maybe we look at what museums exhibit from this period. And then uh, we find, okay, this interesting category, this interesting category. Then we go in these categories, we look at the models of this time, we categorize them, for example, in different ages, like early age, golden age, late age, we apply our criteria and we um, buy or acquire or get the top-ranked models from each category uh, in a, as good condition as possible, as original as possible, as complete as possible, and store them in good conditions for 20 years. I want to give an example of that. So. I decided, okay, I want to look at an age group born in the roughly 2000s, late millennials, early Gen Z, Z people. Also, it's a little bit hard to look at things that do not end at decayed um, borders. And uh, so we look at the imprint phase of these people, and I say maybe this imprint phase is like 2005 to 2015, because they could also be born in 1995. And um, the categories which they are interested in maybe are mobile phones in this period, mobile phones being feature phones, smartphones, game consoles, a category which is going on and on and on, tablet computers, normal computers, maybe even 3D TVs where the appeal to collect it would be that is, they have a feature which you don't have in modern TVs. And that's maybe a good thing. And maybe something like ebook readers also. Um, there's probably no much sentimental value about an ebook reader. And then let's take the list of um, smartphones. And I have just selected um, some models here. We find the uh, early iPhone, we find the HTC Dream. And we find maybe a predecessor like the LG Prada, which was not, a smart, was not a smartphone, but already had a touch screen. Also, no user interface, which used this for finger usage. We have early phase phones. We have maybe middle phase phones. And 2015 doesn't give us like any golden age or late age, um, because that's, that's too early. We could put this um, in a table and then we can try to tick our boxes um, for the criteria. Don't take these values too serious. Um, just put any, something in here. Some have um, brand appeal um, like um, Apple or like Nokia, uh, like Palm. Some are rare, some are not rare. Some have maybe um, historical um, appeal, some have maybe technical appeal, and this uh, might help you concentrate then on things. Uh, this list was a little bit uh, influenced by um, top phones anyway, so I could only exclude, for example, the HPC Pre-1, because maybe the, the brand appeal is not so high. It's rare, but it's not historically or technically relevant. And as I said, only rarity maybe doesn't always or only for us uh, establishes uh, 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 a reason for collecting these things. So coming back to our original questions, I asked, are these good opportunities? 
Uh, and of course, um, it's not easy to give good advice here. One has to be very cautious. So uh, making a business out of them is ri risky, like of course all business opportunities. But here you have to add added, added um, problem that you have to follow a future market um, tightly. You have to weigh your um, investments that you do now over a potential profit in the far future. And uh, you bet on something which might uh, happen in the future or not. So if you bet on uh, e-books are getting um, attractive, maybe you are betting on the, on the wrong horse. If you look, maybe is it a good opportunity for using them as an investment, then I'd say it might be viable if you keep your financial investment at a relatively low level, which is not that hard being in this valley of low prices. If you have the space or money uh, to store them dryly for a long time, because let's not forget, also storing something can cost money um, over time. So to conclude my talk, and yes, this is already the last slide. Uh, we wanted to know how we can spot future retro classic electronic devices in order to buy them when they are still available at reasonable prices. And to that end, we looked at how prices of vintage computers develop over time, or at least at my wild theory of it. We um, learned that I claim that a major driver of increasing retro prices is nostalgia and midlife crises. And we looked at criteria of desirable classic devices. Thank you very much. <laughs> Questions? Um, would another factor perhaps be cultural significance? Um, perhaps this goes under historical significance, but I didn't really understand what you meant by that. But, for instance, uh, products which were prominently featured in very popular movies or television series or something like that. Uh, I think there was, um, I don't remember his name, but he had an, an Altair and, uh, you know, this is the computer that was in War Games. Oh, you know that movie? Yeah. Yes. So... I think you're completely right, and I, I don't think you necessarily can subsume it under historical significance. Yeah, cultural significance might be might be also interesting. Or let's look let, let's have a look at the DeLorean car. It's probably desirable because there was this movie. <laughs> More questions? Yes. Uh, you obviously uh, some type of uh, how long you've been collecting you're collecting stuff uh, do you have some like some stuff that worked out and some stuff that didn't if as a price wise this or is I? not this is not the way that I collected yeah okay <laughs> so so you're not this is just you're not like a collector like that you have some old stuff but you you don't you're not a collector in that way. No, okay. I didn't collect it in that way because mm. this is more my experience from collecting, not necessarily the way that I started to collect or collect today. Yeah. I'm a retro computer collector like you are, <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not necessarily intending to invest my money this way. Also, I um, bought the two Google Glass devices that I have, and I bought two of them, one to keep in original um, box and one to play with, uh, with the hope that my 200 uh, euro investment uh, will maybe increase in the future. So, so you're collecting uh, kind of partially for for investment. Or, I did it maybe more in the context of uh, creating this presentation and this talk than anything else. So. It's more an afterthought than for yes. you. So, so you're not an investment collector. I was always. In, interested in prices uh -huh. of uh, uh, old computers and I had a theory about how the price develops and this is maybe uh -huh. an um, addition to the theory. Okay, thank you. 
Then if there are no more questions, thank you very much and have a nice evening.